It's dark outside, almost 2 a.m. You go outside and look at the sky, and here it is, bright, full moon. You might think you know a lot about Earth's natural satellite, but let me ask you this, how did it form? The answer is, nobody knows. But of course, there are theories. The most popular one, called the Giant Impact Theory, claims that the moon formed during a collision between Earth and another planet. This planet must have been smaller than ours, the size of Mars, and the collision itself probably happened around 4.5 billion years ago. Another theory, called the Capture Theory, claims that the moon used to be an asteroid or some other wandering body. It formed somewhere else in the solar system. When it was passing by Earth, it got caught by our planet's gravity. But here is one catch. Our planet and the moon have remarkable isotopic and chemical similarities. So, they must have a linked history, which means the moon couldn't have been created elsewhere. Other experts think that at some point in the past, Earth was spinning so fast that some of its material broke away. It soon started to orbit our planet. That's how the moon appeared in the sky. But again, there's one problem. In this case, the proportion and type of minerals on the moon would have to be the same as on Earth. But there are slight differences. The moon is richer in materials that form very fast at high temperatures. There's one more theory, and it's probably the least exciting. It claims that Earth's natural satellite could simply appear along with Earth during our planet's formation. Duh! But these days, a more urgent question keeps astronomers busy. Is the moon really Earth's satellite? Or are these two twin planets? The moon is big compared to our planet, about one quarter of Earth's size. That's why some experts refer to our planetary system as a double planet. But how correct is that? If we want to figure it out, we need to give the definition to the word planet. According to the International Astronomical Union, a planet is a space body that orbits the Sun, is massive enough to have a nearly round shape thanks to its gravity, and has cleared the region around its orbit. Now, what about a satellite? It's an object in space that orbits around a larger celestial body. If we take the system Earth the Moon, its center of gravity, called a barycenter, is inside the Earth. That's why at the moment we can't say that we live in a twin planet system. According to this definition, the Moon is the satellite of our planet. Now, let's get back to the past, like 3 or 4 billion years ago. Even though the Moon wasn't a planet, it most likely had a full-fledged atmosphere. It formed at times when powerful volcanic eruptions were rocking our satellite. Gases spread all over the Moon's surface, and it happened so fast that they didn't have enough time to escape into space. At that time, the lunar surface was covered with basins filled with volcanic basalt. Just imagine ginormous plumes of magma hurtling high into the air, falling to the ground and creating lava flows. That's how the basalt basins appeared on the surface of the Moon. At one point, scientists got their hands on samples brought from the Moon. They found out that lava flows there contained not only carbon monoxide and sulfur, but also the building blocks of water. Thanks to these samples, researchers managed to calculate the amount of gas that rose and formed the atmosphere. It became the thickest around 3.5 billion years ago and existed for about 70 million years. After that, poof, the atmosphere was lost in space. But the coolest thing? When the Moon did have an atmosphere, the satellite was 3 to 10 times closer to our planet. One computer simulation even suggests the Moon was probably up to 19 times closer than it is now. The distance between it and our planet could be 18,600 miles, while these days our satellite is around 240,000 miles away. That's why the Moon looked much, much bigger in the sky. Unfortunately, at that time, not even dinos were around to admire the view. These days, the atmosphere of the Moon is almost non-existent, and that's why the satellite can't protect itself from meteorites. The surface of the Moon is dotted with craters. For comparison, there are about 190 identified impact craters on our planet. Many of them are hidden by vegetation or covered with water. But if we speak about the Moon, 
the number is so much greater, several million, and around 5,000 of them are more than 12 miles across. And since the moon is less seismically active than Earth, these craters and other ancient formations stay in perfect condition for centuries. When you look at the moon, it's the brightest object in the night sky. But in reality, its surface is dark because the reflectance of our natural satellite is just a bit higher than that of asphalt. You might know that the moon's gravitational pull causes tides on our planet, making the oceans bulge out on both the side closest to the moon and the one farthest from the satellite. But that's not all. The moon also slows down Earth's rotation. This phenomenon is known as tidal breaking. It increases the length of a day on Earth by a bit more than 2 milliseconds per 100 years. The moon is also moving away from Earth at the same rate at which your fingernails grow. That's about 1.5 inches per year. If one day the moon floats away into space, our planet will have to live through tough times. Without the stabilizing pull of the moon's gravity, Earth's tilt would start changing wildly from no tilt at all, meaning no seasons, to a large tilt, resulting in extreme weather. Even though the moon's surface is mostly dormant, Earth's natural satellite still experiences moon quakes. One theory suggests that they may be happening because the moon is shrinking as its insides are cooling. Scientists say that the moon has become around 150 feet skinnier than it used to be several hundred million years ago. To help you understand it, picture a grape turning into a raisin. It wrinkles while shrinking. The same is happening to the moon. It's shrinking and it's wrinkling. But unlike the grape, the moon doesn't have flexible skin. Its surface is hard and brittle. So as the moon gets smaller, the crust cracks and breaks, and its sections get pushed over neighboring parts. Want to know another cool thing about the moon? A recent study claims that it has a tail. And every month, it wraps around our planet like a scarf. This slender tail is made up of millions of atoms of sodium. And our planet regularly travels directly through it. Meteor strikes blast these sodium atoms out of the moon's surface and further into space. For several days every month, the moon remains between the sun and our planet. That's when Earth's gravity picks that sodium tail. Our planet drags it into a long stripe that wraps around its atmosphere. This lunar tail is totally harmless. It's also invisible to the human eye. 50 times dimmer than what you can perceive. But during those rare days, high-powered telescopes can spot its faint yellowish glow in the sky. The tail looks like a gleaming spot that's five times the full moon's diameter. And the spiciest fact for you, Two or three years ago, an asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel around the planet. Even though it was no larger than an average car, it was still a big deal. Out of more than one million asteroids astronomers know about, it was only the second one to orbit our planet, called 2020 CD3. It was our temporary mini-moon. It didn't stay with Earth for long, though. The asteroid followed a random orbit and slowly drifted away. Temporarily captured objects such as 2020 CD3 are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be caught by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. It was January 7th in 1610 when Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei made an astonishing discovery using his homemade telescope four moons orbiting the planet Jupiter. By the way, these days you can make your own version of his telescope using cardboard tubes, lenses, and some super glue. The main point of this DIY telescope is to place two lenses at the correct distance from each other. You'll need two lenses. One lens should be concave, the other one convex. So one lens is curved out and the other one is curved in. Galileo's initial telescope was able to magnify objects approximately 8 times. He continued to improve it until it reached about 20 times the magnifying power. But let's get back to the main story, shall we? When he first looked at those four moons of Jupiter, he believed he was simply looking at a bunch of stars. But he soon noticed that these space objects seemed to be moving in a regular pattern. 
It took him a couple of weeks to figure out that what he was looking at were not stars, but moons circling Jupiter. Galileo initially named those moons 1, 2, 3, and 4. But let's face it, those weren't the most creative names. As more moons in our galaxy were discovered later, the numerical system for naming them became confusing and impractical, so it lasted for just a few centuries. So, these days, those four satellites, Jupiter's largest, are named Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They're collectively known as the Galilean moons to honor the man who first noticed them. Galileo's discovery was crucial for our later understanding of astronomy. It was initially believed that other objects revolved around the Earth since it was seen as the center of the universe. We now know that there are hundreds of moons in our solar system. However, large moons, like those discovered by Galileo Galilei, are not so commonly stumbled upon. A moon is considered large when it's the size of our planet or bigger. Ganymede, for instance, is bigger than Mercury. We basically call Ganymede a moon just because it orbits Jupiter. Otherwise, it has all the other characteristics of a planet. It's no surprise that Jupiter has the biggest moons in the area. It beats all the other planets in our solar system in both size and mass. So no wonder it pulled in a lot of other objects towards it. Jupiter is believed to have in total almost 80 moons, with only 53 of them being given official names until today. The first of those Jupiterian moons to be discovered by Galileo was Io. What sets it apart is the fact that it has a lot of volcanoes. Io is the only space object to have active volcanoes in our solar system, apart from Earth. It's also nicknamed the Moon of Fire and Ice because of its sulfur dioxide snowfields. Io's outer layer is splotchy, featuring multiple colors like orange, black, yellow, white, and red. That's probably the reason why NASA described it as a giant pizza covered with melted cheese and splotches of tomato and ripe olives. Because of that sulfur though, Io doesn't smell that appetizing, something similar to a rotten egg. There are more than 100 mountains on the surface of this moon. They are a lot larger than those we see on Earth, some being bigger than Mount Everest. On average, these mountains are 4 miles tall and 98 miles long. Because of those active volcanoes and the intense radiation on Io, there's little chance that life as we know it could exist here. But hey, who's to say it can't have life the way we don't know it? Next on the list of Galilean moons is Europa, the smallest of the four. It's comparable in size to the moon. Europa has an entirely icy surface, with just a bunch of craters scattered here and there. Because of that outer layer, Europa is very reflective, making it one of the brightest moons out there. As for its age, scientists believe its surface to be somewhere between 20 to 180 million years old. Europa is about 4.5 billion years old. What lies beneath that icy surface is impressive. It may even hold the secret to life outside Earth. Ice forms here in two ways. The first is through congelation. A rather self-explanatory process. Ice just grows as the surrounding environment gets colder and colder. The other method, though, is a lot more fascinating. A layer of supercooled water found under the ice shell reacts when agitated. It then generates these crystals that make it look like it's snowing in reverse, floating upwards to the ice sheet they sit under. You can recreate this environment yourself at home. Take a bottle of purified water and place it into the freezer. If you don't have purified water anywhere near, just boil some water a couple of times to get rid of as many impurities as possible. Since there won't be any particles inside, once in the freezer, it won't turn solid. But if you take the bottle out of the freezer and give it a shake, the impact will make the water rapidly crystallize, transforming it into a slush-like consistency. There may be water on Europa, but there's little evidence so far that life exists on this moon. However, it's one of the highest candidates in the solar system for potential habitability. Some sort of life forms could adapt to live there in its under-ice ocean. 
that environment is most likely similar to what we can find in our planet's hydrothermal vents hidden deep within our oceans. The amount of oxygen in Europa's atmosphere is very little, but in 2013, NASA gave away some cool evidence. This yet again supports the theory that there is potential for life on this moon. It seems that Europa might be venting water into space. If this is confirmed by future observations, it could also mean that Europa is geologically active. It could also come in handy if we'd manage to study water sources one day. The largest of those Galilean moons is Ganymede. It's also the biggest moon in our solar system altogether. It's a low-density space object similar to Mercury in size, but having only half of its mass. However, Ganymede is the only moon out there to feature its own magnetic field. It's quite small though, and we can barely notice it from Earth since it's overshadowed by Jupiter's much more powerful magnetic field. Another cool aspect of Ganymede is that its atmosphere contains oxygen. Don't get too excited, it's not nearly enough to support any life forms living there. Back in December 2021, a 50-second audio clip was released, which was previously recorded by NASA's probe on its Ganymede flyby. For the inexperienced, the sounds were more similar to those of an old dial-up internet connection. But because of its quirky tunes, Ganymede was soon nicknamed Jupiter's Singing Moon. Finishing up the list of Galilean moons is Callisto, or the most heavily cratered object in our solar system. What's interesting about this moon is that its landscape has barely changed since it formed, and scientists are still debating why this is happening. Most other space objects go through loads of changes throughout their lifetimes because of events such as collisions with other objects, changes in orientation or speed, or chemical reactions happening on their surface. Callisto is also about the size of the planet Mercury, but it has a lower density. Jupiter's magnetic field has a lesser impact here, since Callisto is the furthest from the giant planet. Its surface is estimated to be a staggering 4 billion years old. As opposed to Io, Callisto is not geologically active, but scientists believe there might be an ocean hiding underneath the moon's surface, which may potentially harbor life. The fact that it's less impacted by Jupiter's magnetic field means that it features low levels of radiation. Given this suitable environment, we may one day end up setting a human base for future explorations here. About 8 billion inhabitants of planet Earth found out the same terrible news in one day. Someone saw it on TV. Others heard it on the phone while scrolling through social media or listening to music. Some witnessed this news in a dream while sleeping. Someone's voice said it in all languages to ensure everyone understood it. I have good news and bad news for you. Let's start with the bad news. You're all characters in YouTube videos in which your planet gets into a situation where the moon breaks in half. For the audience, it will be a hypothetical story, but for you, these events will become a reality. The good news is that I was joking. There is no good news. But don't worry, the apocalypse won't start on your planet. Maybe just a little bit. Have a nice day. At first, the entire population panics. Then, a few days later, everyone calms down. Maybe it was a mass hallucination, and the moon will be all right. But at this moment, scientists have discovered the danger. A colossal meteorite is flying towards us from the distant depths of space. This meteorite is super fast and pretty flat, but has sharp edges. Fortunately, it will miss the Earth by a few thousand miles, but the moon won't be that lucky. The meteorite flies through our Earth's only natural satellite directly in the middle. So it passes through the moon, sweeps past our planet, and flies away into distant space. At this moment, all people can't take their eyes off the moon. The meteorite cuts it perfectly in half, gently, clearly, painlessly. So what shall we do now? Will the Earth survive this? Our satellite breaks into two equal parts, but fortunately, they don't fly away from each other. The moon's great gravity attracts them back like a magnet. Scientists are sure that the parts will connect in a couple of billion years and the moon will become the same as it used to be. But the coolest thing is that people won't feel any changes. Everyone around the world will celebrate this good news. The voice was wrong. 
But then, another problem appears. A massive meteorite in the form of a shoe is flying from the deepest space to us. It enters our solar system and approaches the Earth at high speed. The space boot crashes into one half of the moon and then flies away. Now, the moon is definitely breaking into two parts. The first half remains in the same place. The second one is flying towards us. A small meteor shower begins on Earth because of the falling moon fragments. But it's not so bad. Most of these rocks are burning up in the atmosphere. But almost the entire split-off half is falling apart around the orbit of our planet. It forms a stone belt. Now the Earth is like Saturn. Rotating fragments destroy part of our artificial satellites. Communication and the Internet work inconsistently. It takes people a couple of years to restore a stable connection. The International Space Station no longer exists. Luckily, all the astronauts managed to return to Earth before half the moon got to them. So, moon rocks are flying around the planet, and people see half the moon in the sky. Life doesn't change much for the first few days, but those who live on the coast of the seas and oceans notice the consequences. The moon used to influence the tides. It was flying around the Earth and made oceans take an oval shape. There were tides on the side where the moon was closer. There were ebbs on the opposite side. But now, this schedule is wrong. Half of the moon attracts less water. Yes, the moon lost half its weight and began approaching the Earth. But its gravitational force has become weaker. Seabirds, many species of fish, sea turtles, and other coastal animals may not survive these changes. Their natural instincts associated with the moon help them determine the time for getting food, breeding, and flying south. For example, tiny turtles expect a strong tide in the morning. They run to the water, but the water doesn't reach them. Turtles can't hide in the ocean in time and become dinner for seagulls. Crabs can't lay eggs because the tide has started earlier than usual. Wolves go mad in the woods. They howl loudly every night and can't stop. The whole natural world can't understand what's going on. The human body is also feeling some discomfort. Many people have low and high blood pressure, and some experience severe headaches. Half of the moon changes the entire ecosystem of the planet. Adapting to new conditions will take several tens, maybe hundreds of years. A couple of weeks pass, and people notice the days are now shorter. The moon always slowed the Earth's rotation and made one day last 24 hours. The Earth is spinning faster now. The night and the morning come earlier than everyone is used to. Earth rotation speed has increased and reduced the number of hours per day to 15. People suffer from insomnia or oversleeping. The body needs time to get used to it. Work schedules are changing all over the world. Previously, people came to the office at 9 and left at 6. Now, they arrive at 7 and leave at 2 p.m. Sleep time got shorter, and people are really sad because of this. Progress slows down because the short working time. The technologies of the future are now 20 to 30 years late. Hourly pay remains the same, so bosses now pay less for fewer working hours. The whole moon stabilized the weather and climate on the planet. Look at Mars. It has two small moons. They quickly spin around it and rock Mars around on its axis. As a result, strong winds, sandstorms, and thunderstorms often happen on the red planet. Now the half of the moon that approached us takes the Earth out of stable rotation. This changes the seasonal temperatures in the world. It even gets hotter in hot places. And snowstorms are raging in cold regions. There are short, massive downpours instead of sunny weather. A typical breeze can grow into a hurricane and small waves into a tsunami. The seasons are changing faster now. Winters are colder and summers are hotter. Changing the rotation of the planet affects the Earth's magnetic field. Since the compass and navigation systems are unstable now, we need to recalculate where the north and south are. Birds can't fly south to wait out the winter since they don't know what direction to fly. Their inner compass is broken. Several hundred years have passed. People are entirely accustomed to the new conditions on Earth. New species of animals and fish have appeared. Birds can navigate the sky by the moon again. The planet's economy has been restored. Hourly wages have become higher. 
people now get enough sleep from 5 to 6 hours a day and work for 4 to 5 hours. The reduction of day and night has also affected the entertainment industry. Movies now last one hour. One episode of some TV series lasts 30 minutes. Life goes faster. An average person now lives to be 96 years old. In fact, the passage of time hasn't changed at all. Its calculus did. Several thousand years have passed. People look different now. Now they have big eyes that absorb more light. Half of the moon doesn't shine as bright as the whole thing, so the nights have become darker. It took the human eye a couple of thousand years to develop the ability to see clearly in this new dark. Animals need to navigate better in these conditions, so their eyes have become larger and more sensitive. During all this time, people have cleared the orbit of moon rocks. Several space stations fly around our planet. And again, people hear this strange voice that once told them that they were all characters in one hypothetical YouTube video. This time, the voice says, Your story ends because the video ends. I'm sorry. Good night. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.